No one lays down the law like Car and Key. This is the Law Report on SAFM. And a very good evening to you from tonight's Law Report program. Well, as you know, once a month here on the Law Report, we run a legal clinic trying to answer a range of questions on a number of different topics. And tonight, it's again time to open the lines for you to ask that particular legal question that doesn't quite fit into the other topics we discuss here on the Law Report. And I'm joined once again this evening by attorney Arinda Trutter, and she's a junior associate at Schoolman Law Inc. Attorneys, Conveyances and Notaries Public. Arinda, good evening. Welcome back to the show. Good evening, very happy to be here. Now this is your last evening, well your last uh, sort of programmed evening with us because you've My been standing in for Nicolene <laughs> yes. while she's been off on maternity leave. So first of all, thank you so much for stepping into her shoes and filling them so admirably. It was a pleasure. Thank you, we've enjoyed having you. Thank you, I really enjoyed it. Well, I'm sure too. we won't be the last we see of you, so um, but thank <laughs> you for stepping in on your own. It's been really great to have you. And you're probably all tired of me now by going on and on about Wills Week. Well, it's here now. This is actually National Wills Week. So if you haven't yet made that appointment to go and have your will done, and bear in mind that it's a basic first time will only, make sure you drop me an email this evening to law at safm.co.za. Let me know which province you're in, and I'll send you the list of participating attorneys in your province. And then I suggest you call one of them closest to you first thing in the morning as these slots are filling up really fast and you've only got until Friday this week to have it done. And talking about wills, before we get into the show for this evening, I'd like to welcome Liz Linsell and she's head of the Legacy Programme at the Children's Hospital Trust and she'll be telling us why Wills Week is important for them. Liz, good evening. Welcome to the show. Hello, Karen. Good evening and good evening to all your listeners. Thanks for having me on your show. It's a pleasure. Now, Wills Week is quite important for the Legacy Programme. Tell us why. Well, it's very important to us in terms of fundraising for the Red Cross War Memorial Children's Hospital. Uh, many people uh, who would like to give more in their lifetime but really just can't afford to with the pressures of, you know, of life as they are, um, they choose to put a gift in their will and, and give us a little bit more than they might have been able to do uh, during their, their lifetime of giving. So um, we feel that's an opportunity that we can offer people to consider um, as, a, as a way of, of contributing towards the uh, the health of, of very sick children at the Red Cross Children's Hospital. As you mentioned, all the money that is donated and that comes into the Legacy Program goes towards working with the children and helping out the Red Cross War Memorial Children's Hospital. What kinds of things are you looking to do with that, Liz? Uh, well, it's uh, obviously we, we, we can never predict when a, yeah. a, a, a gift and will is going to actually come come through. But um, whatever our priority project at the hospital is at that time, uh, that that is effectively where that legacy would be put towards, and we we're very very careful that we efficiently and wisely use legacy gifts. And as you said, a hundred percent of all gifts to the Children's Hospital Trust goes to the hospital. There's a lovely story behind this whole legacy program and where it started. Well, the War Memorial Children's Hospital actually, where that started with the returning soldiers from the Second World War. Yes, yes, it's a wonderful story. And, and that's where, in fact, the hospital got its stand, the Red Cross War Memorial Children's Hospital. And those soldiers in World War II chose to give two days of their pay. That was held in trust by the Red Cross. And when they came back to South Africa, the Children's Hospital became uh, a reality. They didn't just want a statue. They wanted a living memorial that would really impact on children's lives, having seen what war did to children. So we like to draw the, the comparison of the, the the soldiers fighting for a better life, for freedom, for you know a better world, and the children at the hospital fighting for their own lives through this legacy that the ex servicemen left to South Africa. How do people actually go about doing this, Liz? Do they just approach the attorney when they're making their will and they get this added into the will? Can they contact you directly? They can contact me directly. Um, they can either go onto our website where we have the list which you've just mentioned. But more importantly, we have a number of attorneys and estate advisors who actually have uh, agreed to give their advice free and draw up the basic will throughout the course of the year should the donor wish the beneficiary to be the Red Cross Children's Hospital Trust. So um, that, that's one thing to remember. But um, people can contact me, they can ask questions, I can direct them to, uh, to an attorney who has partnered with us. And we also have a wills guide, which is on our website, which they can download, which is a very useful source of information, what to take with you, what sort of information to take with you when you're going for a consultation. 
So this is something, it's one of those things we talk about wills and, you know, it's not, when you talk about the legacy program, it's not something that people would automatically think about. That's why I like to mention it when it's, especially when it's mm. wills week, just to put it front of mind of people when they're thinking, because a lot of people out there looking to, do, as you say, do some good, but they can't afford to right now. So at some point later in their life, when they are possibly able to leave something and, you know, and when we talk about leaving a legacy, people think, oh gosh, well, I didn't really have all that much. It doesn't have to be a fortune. I th I'm sure you would agree, Liz, every little bit helps. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, you know, there is no, no minimum, no maximum. We, we have had some major uh, legacy donors and they've basically helped to fund a major ward in the hospital or the new ICU. And for that, we give uh, sort of in remembrance naming rights. But we also have a lovely garden of remembrance where we put up plaques in remembrance of uh, all our legacy donors in a beautiful book of remembrance and our day of remembrance. So, you know, we feel that most people would like to feel that they've been remembered, that they've made an impact in their life in the future, and to know that they've been part of future generations of children who've regained their lives thanks to their forethought. I will give out the website and the telephone number again. Oh, well, I haven't given it out yet, but I will give that out as well if people want to make a note. And if you miss that information, you always know you can just email me at law at safm.co.za and I'll pass that information on to you. Liz, thank Wonderful. you very much indeed for joining us on the show. And I wish you much success with this year's Wills Week. And hopefully we'll have a lot more people considering leaving something to the children at the Hospital Trust. Thank you so I, much for your time. I do hope so. Thank you very much indeed. I hope I get lots of phone calls tomorrow. I hope so but too. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Liz. Really Good night. Bye bye. Yes, night. Liz Lincell is head of the Legacy Program at the Children's Hospital Trust. And for more information, you can take a look. It's www.childrenshospitaltrust.org.za or you can call them on 021 686 7860. Now we have some emails to get through, but if you have any questions for us, you can call us now on 0892 10 2010. 0892 10 2010. No one lays down the law like Karen Key. This is the Law Report on SAFM. Right, our emails. You can call in now if you'd like to leave your name and number with my producer. We'll get back to you as soon as we're done. We don't have many emails, so if you'd like to call in now, that would be great. And um, the number, just a reminder, 0892 10 2010. Right, Arinda, the first one, it's head of divorce, marriage and community. It's a, I'm a male, age 58, says the the listener and not working i'm on a disability grant originally from kzn now living in Mpumalanga. my problem is i'm trying to divorce my wife using legal aid towards the end of 2014 she was served with a summons last year her lawyer said that since we married before 1998 we are married out of community of property although the certificates show in community of property and that was about march 2015. to my surprise my lawyer from legal aid changed and agreed with her lawyer that all black people at that time married out of community of property. Before we go any further, I'm sure that isn't right. Mm -mm. You, I mean, because out of community of property is anti-nuptial. Yes. And you have to have a proper signed thing. It's a legal document. You would have been to see a lawyer and it costs you quite a lot of money. And you would have known if you, if that you didn't are. generally just let people. So everybody was married in community. Mm -hmm. So these lawyers, I don't know whether he's got the story <laughs> wrong, but this doesn't sound right. Okay. He then says, I went back to find the original certificate, but they still said no. In June 2015, she resigned and withdrew all her pension. Now I'm told that I'm not entitled to any money. And to cut it short, this is what has happened. The house in KZN has been sold. It's very strange as we both signed, but when it comes to the pension, the marriage is out of community of property. I've agreed that we keep whatever we took from the house. There's also another house in Joburg, which she bought without my knowledge. I was ill and in and out of hospital. She used my ID and forged my signature, and then he gives us a case number. I reported it to the bank as well, but they now want me to pay. Since she resigned, the house is in arrears. Each time I ask about this fraud case, Saps gives it to a new detective and promise speedy investigation, but nothing happens. Only last week I learned that the case went to court and was withdrawn without my knowledge. Please advise urgently because legal aid is refusing to continue with my case. The reason for this is because I asked to go to court after consulting other lawyers and even home affairs and they all confirmed the marriage is in community of property. Mm -hmm. Right, and before we carry on, I just want to apologize. I'm now on round two of the flu, so I suddenly start <laughs> coughing or spluttering. I do apologize, but literally this is now, I had six weeks of flu, one week off last week, and now I'm doing it again. So I do apologize <laughs> if I don't sound terribly good. Right, Arinda, this just sounds weird. Yes, um, I did a bit of research as well just to make sure, but a customary marriage entered into before 15 November 2000, that's when the Recognition of Customary Marriages Act came into working. So any customary marriage entered into before that time is considered in community of property. The 
The Act says that the marriage should have been valid according to customary law and tradition at that point. And the Act goes further to say that if you were married in that time, you need to go to Home Affairs and register your marriage. But the, f the further point that I might have to make here is that this is applicable to monogamous customary marriages. So all monogamous customary marriages before the 15th of November 2000 was considered in community of property. Actually, all marriages after the act came into working is still considered in community unless you have entered into an anti-nap, like we said before. So I agree with the listener here that he is correct. His marriage was definitely in community of property. And this means that he is entitled to 50% of the joint estate and also 50% of her pension that paid out now. This also means that any immovable property could not have been sold without his consent. But it has been by all accounts. Exactly. And also she could not have bought immovable property well, without his consent. Well, she did. Well, she signed a forged signature, he so says. It was definitely fraud. And I understand why he opened a fraud case. I don't understand why the police are not taking it any further. Obviously, he has the evidence to prove it. So maybe you should see if he can seek a different route to approach but, but that again. But why would legal aid just not be wanting to help him? I don't understand it. I, I, maybe they have a bit of a big workload and they don't see the need. To he seems to think it's because it. he actually asked to go to court. Yeah. After consulting other lawyers and even home affairs, it says, and they all confirm the marriage is in community of property. Yes. But now he's he's saying that because of all of that, legal aid is ignoring him. I don't think that really that would be the case. No. There must be some other reason somewhere. There must somewhere. be some other reason. Um, but I do, I do think he, he, he shouldn't just leave it here. No. Because now, obviously, because they're married in community of property, that's why the bank is calling him. Because they are both liable for 50% of the debt. But she resigned and now the house is in arrears. Now he's in trouble. Yes, because even though this house was brought into the marriage in a fraudulent manner, it's now part of the joint estate and they both ha are liable for the debt. So he should definitely not leave it here. I would suggest he either... Ask to be appointed a different legal aid lawyer, maybe even go to a different branch of legal aid. To well, but possibly, he's, to he's, I think he's, he's in, where is he? He says he's in Mpumalanga. Yes. I was trying to think the, the university, What I don't know what university, the, they have a law clinic yes, there. Yes, the university should have a law clinic just for someone else to look at his case. Even if he has to um, approach a, a lawyer in his area that maybe can help him pro bono. There is that organization called probono.org, which actually does, I'm not sure if this is the kind of case they would take on. But mm -hmm. it's worth having a look. It's worth having a look instead of leaving it, because I definitely think he shouldn't leave it. Even if he, at the end of the day, has to go to court himself, because he, it seems like he's the applicant in the divorce as he issued summons. He can go to court himself, ask the clerk to give him a court date, serve it on his spouse and go to court, state his case to the magistrate. He's allowed to represent himself and the magistrate will listen to him. And at the end of the day, the marriage is in community of property. So you should definitely not leave it. Yeah. Um, listener, you have asked to be anonymous. I won't mention your name, but I, I do have your email address. Mm -hmm. So what I will do is if, um, I will actually send you that probona.org um, email address and website. Then you can have a look. I don't know whether they'll take on this kind of case, but it's worth a shot. You give them a call and maybe they can either point you in the right direction or possibly yes. assist you and just um, have a try. Right. The next email concerns medical malpractice and Colin has sent us this very long email and it sounds absolutely horrendous. I mean, I, we can't read all this out because first of all, my voice would go completely. But it is absolutely, it's literally you read through this and you honestly think how this listener actually survived all of this is quite mm -hmm. beyond me. I mean, there was glaring errors done by our hospital, a number of, well, two hospitals, I think, a number of doctors. I mean, it's just absolutely awful. And he's at the end of it been left quite debilitated and is unable to work now because of, of what's, what, what went on. And now he wants to know, can he sue? He, he knows it's longer than three years, but he wanted mm -hmm. to know if he can sue the hospital or the doctor or, you know, what can he do? Is there anything he can do now? In general, you can sue a doctor for physical and emotional damages as well as loss of future income, like him now that can't work anymore. That's definitely something you can sue the doctor for, but you need to have the assistance of attorneys and specifically someone that specializes in medical malpractice. Um, that would be your first step. There are a number of elements that need to be present when you sue a doctor. Firstly, there needs to be a duty of care between the doctor or the hospital staff and yourself. And the duty needs to be breached. 
and this breach then needs to lead to injury which is either then financial or emotional damages so it's, it's a bit of a difficult case to prove that's why you need a specialist on your side however in this case just as any other civil claim, the free years prescription is applicable. And unfortunately, it seems from this that the free years has run already. So this case has prescribed. And I don't think he will be able to sue the doctor after the free years has prescribed. Unless he can prove that something interrupted the prescription. If there's maybe a letter of demand that he doesn't let us know about. Anything like that. But as, it's, it, doesn't as it seem says now even though he was in a world of pain and he should definitely have a case against these doctors and the hospital. I think he left it a bit late. Because it's, it sort of went on for a couple of years. It wasn't like it happened in a week no, or something. This went, went on for quite a long years, time. So, yes. you know, it was a long thing that went on and different on and on. Hospitals, and it doctors. just is, yeah, I think it started in 2011 and went on until 2013. Yes. And, um, you know, it was, it's, so you, but generally you say it's, it's too late now. It's too late. Yeah, Unfortunately. The three years are, yeah. are done. Right, our last email. So if you're wanting to call in, the number is 0892 10 2010. Last email says, I'm under currently under voluntary sequestration. I stay in the Southern Cape and applied at someone as an agent here. I currently, I'm currently paying 3,500 Rand monthly for their service and I have been doing for about eight months. I never received any correspondence from their law firm. The lawyer's company is in Pretoria. A month ago, the curator phoned me, who's also in Pretoria, and told me that he's coming to take my assets, which is, according to him, an amount of 93,000 Rand. During the telephonic conversation, I was shocked to hear the information. He told me, my, we, well, I was shocked to hear the information that he told me. First of all, my address is incorrect. Instead of the address in the Southern Cape, the same address was in Johannesburg. I denied it. The curator told me that I knew this is forgery. He then emailed me the document, and to my surprise, my assets listed were totally wrong. I had assets I could only wish I had. <laughs> this was my second knock. What do I do in this situation? I'm worried because this is very problematic to me. Th this just sounds... We seem to have all these people having these really strange mm. episodes tonight. This doesn't sound right either. No, and it's interesting that they say it's, it's forgery, but the mistake is on their, their side. side. Yeah. <laughs> No, a voluntary sequestration has to be applied for by the by the debtor. This is an application that's brought in the High Court. So he says so he, he applied assume, in the Southern Cape, yes. an agent there of the law firm who's in Pretoria. Yes, yeah, so I assume he's paying the attorneys for the application in the High Court. Um, then after, after the court makes the order for the sequestration, a curator is appointed and he is able to come and obtain the assets and then sell it and the value thereof will be distributed between the creditors. But obviously there was a big slip of information through the cracks here, or big miscommunication it seems, and the creator will obviously not be able to take assets that is not in existence. But the, even the address is wrong, I mean that's... No, it's, it doesn't seem right. So I would say he should obtain a copy of the court order, because the court order would set out his address, all his details, the details of the sequestration. And if it's all wrong on there, then obviously the lawyer's made a mistake in bringing the application. Because he's paying 3,500 Rand a month for eight months already. Which is crazy already. I can't think that... He for their service, he says. That doesn't seem... I mean, normally when that's you paying off your debt. Yes. That's not for... So you so shouldn't it, be paying that for their service. It should be for their service. It should be towards the debt. So I'm, this doesn't I'm sound not right. sure what, what's going on there. So I think he should either try and speak to the curator or the attorneys that he has on mandate already and if he can't get through to them he should end that mandate as soon as possible and what happens all this money is paid now unfortunately because he's paid it into an uh, account for a lawyer and if they can show valid invoices for for, for that much services, money every month i don't think so i don't think so no. either i don't believe that it's it can be but is he, there sort of an ombud or something that deals with this or who, who is there someone he can go to that can he, help him he should be able to go to the to the um, national credit ombud maybe i think that would maybe help him but otherwise i don't i think it's more miscommunication at this point and might be a bit of negligence on the side of the attorneys when they drafted the application and now this miscommunication and wrong information has sifted through to the curator that has to obtain assets now for stuff exist. it doesn't have, yeah. Yes.
So basically, his first step is to ask for a copy of that court of order. The court order, definitely. And, they, and he is obliged; they are obliged yes. to give it to him. No, it's his legal right to have that's, that. So it's his right. He should already have it, actually. Okay. They should have sent it to him as soon. No, as well, that's the point. Granted. He says he's been paying all this, and he's never received any, any correspondence no, from the law that's, firm. That's not. That's not right no, either. No, no, is, can all. he go to the to the law society yes, on this? Of can course. he? He can definitely lay a complaint at the law society against the attorneys, especially if they were negligent in bringing the application and they had the wrong information because okay. that's going to affect him negatively now so he can definitely lay a claim against them anton if you just said uh, just first of all ask for a copy of that mm. which they should have sent you now anyway already yes but you can actually if you having bad service from this law firm in get in touch mandate. with your law society which is and i will actually find out i've got your email address i will actually send you the conf the, the contact details for the law society in your area yes. and which is the southern cape which is probably the cape the cape, law society. the cape law society so yes. i will send you the contact details for the cape law society and they possibly will be able to direct you where to go from here yes i think because that just doesn't sound right they have the complaint process on the website as well that you can just fill in the complaint on online as well okay so i will do that i'll drop that email mm. down so you'll have all of that right okay let's take our first caller tonight jabu in roslyn pretoria good evening uh, good evening how are you very well and you how can we help I'm you right. i'm dead i'm just um, a quick one welcome um, um, i'm currently in a transaction of switching my bond from from bank a to bank b i'm already having approval from bank b i just i'm, I'm having a bit of a confusion with regards to the uh, the transfer cost I'm I'm already two almost one year six months on the current bond with Bank A. Now switching to Bank B, I'm, I'm a bit curious as to would it be a best decision to switch to Bank B because they are giving me quite a good interest rate at the moment. They are giving me um at 11.7 compared to the 12.24 which I was getting from Bank A. Bank A. I'm I'm, I'm looking to get an advice as to um. What should I be looking at here? Which thing should I be guarding against here? Thank you so much. Jabu, this isn't really, we do, this banking law is something completely different. I, I, Arinda, I don't know whether it's something you feel qualified to talk about moving your bond and with interest rate. I don't know how all of that no, works and how that. I, I just, I just, the only thing that I think is relevant to understand is that your current bond is basically going to have to be cancelled. Yeah. And you're going to have to apply for the new bond. And you have to pay cancellation fees. So you're going to and... have to pay cancellation fees for the cancellation of the bond. And then again, costs for applying for the new bond and to get it registered. Yes, I've already got, I'm already going through that process of, of, of cancellation. And then on the bank, they have already gotten an approval. The only thing that's for me to uh, to agree to the uh, uh, bank be a uh, loan. The only thing I was checking is... um. Um, I, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm not exactly sure at the moment whether it would be the best thing to switch, but I'm concerned that I'm paying quite a hefty interest rate with Bank A when I compare myself with other people. I know I have to consider my credit profile uh, um, as a person, but then when I check still that, I still feel that whatever I'm getting from Bank B is better than what I'm getting. And then I'm, I'm also concerned of the period that I've already been ha having with Bank A. I'm just checking if there's anything that i can be assisted with here we can't actually give you advice on your banking um Jabi, because then if something goes wrong we could be held liable for that so we oh, cannot we cannot give you advice on changing banks and interest rates interest on bonds rates. we cannot yeah. advise you on that because as i said then it will be we would be liable if something happened and you weren't happy with it it would then be our fault we yeah. can't we can't do that in all good conscience no, I understand. Thank you. I'm so sorry we can't help you. It's just that we, we can't offer advice on, on changing your bond. It's, it's really not something that we qualify to deal with, Jobby. I'm so sorry. Okay, thanks. Okay. And if you'd like to get through to us with a question, 0892 10 2010. 2010 and please don't leave it to the last minute because then we can't get you on and then we miss out having to be able to help you with your hopefully help you with your question. <laughs> right, our next caller, Depur in Free State. Good evening. Hi, ma'am. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine. I'm just having a question just to ask you. I've been divorced, and my final divorce was in 2015, January, on the 26th. What I want to know is this, um, the property that we stayed, uh, where, where both, they said that we are going to, he's going to buy me out because I went out from, the, from that house. Now, it seems as if 
because he was also complaining that uh, we're supposed to have a liquidator because I've taken so many things and whatever and so on and so on. But eventually what I wa- want to ask you, it seems as if, according to the liquidator, most of us are working at the government. It seems as if he must pay them, the, must buy me out with the money that is going to get, get from my pension. Okay, so basically you're, because you're getting divorced, you've had to split your pension with him. Is that what you're saying? What, what I'm saying is both of us are working at the, at the government. Okay, so you'd I, both you'd both have to split your pensions with each other, effectively. So you get, you get other, half of his and now, he gets half of yours, okay? Yes. But now there's no way that he can pay me, buy me out for that house because now he has to wait for the money from, the, from my pension so that he can be able maybe to deduct the money from that and pay me. Oh, right. right. Okay, so he's waiting for your pension payout before yes. he'll actually pay you out for the house because you're obviously married in community of property, I would imagine. Yes. Okay, mm-hmm. so, Arinda, what, can he do that? Um, well, there is a court order now that says he needs to buy her out, so it's enforceable by the court. But obviously, mm. if he doesn't have the money, mm. then there's not much you can do instead of just waiting for your pension to pay out. How long does that normally take? It shouldn't take that long. Maximum three months. For was the they married? Like, when did this happen? The poor last year, you said. Last year, but we're still waiting. I've been, I've been trying to phone those people there at the pension. No. Each and every time they will say that he have been working on it, they've been working on it, but nothing is, has ever happened until now. No, it definitely shouldn't take that long. It should take you maximum three months for the, for especially government, because they, mm. they have strict rules regarding that and strict rules regarding what documentation you need to fill in. So it definitely shouldn't take that long. You should follow up with them regarding that. It should have been paid out already. Okay, but there's nothing that I can do maybe for them to speed up the process because even that, the liquidator went there last week Friday and they said that I phoned them on Monday and they said that I'm still working on it. Maybe you should just find out if there's anything, any documents that they still need that are not there or any other information that they still require to make the payout. Well, they said that everything is there, but I don't know what's holding them back. Because normally the the thing that holds it back is proof of the the person's banking details, which would be your ex spouse's banking details to pay the money into, and he needs but, to sign a yeah. certain affidavit for that. Okay, but we did according to the liquid my liquidator. He said that he did everything. He even went there himself, but now I don't know really. No, the poor. You I what I what I suggest you do tune into the program next week. Because next week I'm going to be talking to a pension fund, a pension lawyer. Okay. He actually talks all about his name as attorney Jonathan Moot, and he's going to be in the studio talking about pensions. We've had so many people querying problems mm. with pension funds, and mm. we, we so I've actually got him on next week. So he's going to be talking about pension funds and hopefully helping people. So maybe if you called us next week, or what, if you like, we've got your number. We can yes, keep sir. it. We can call you next week during the show. Would you like us to do that? Please, ma'am. And then you can talk to him. Maybe he can assist you or give you some advice. Mm. All right. Thank you so much, ma'am. All right. So we'll do that. So wait, look out for our call next week. We'll call you during the show. All right, ma'am. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, Dupur. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye-bye. We've had so many people calling over the last few weeks. Of, I mean, last last time on the, on the labor law program, we had a number of people who had discovered that there would be pen, uh, deductions have been coming off their salaries mm. for the pension. But it hadn't quite made it from their salary to the pension fund. It kind of got diverted by the company and it had disappeared somewhere, you know, bought a new car or overseas trip, or whatever. Um, I, whatever. Yes. <laughs> but there's, been, there's so many people sitting with the same problem and with pension strict funds. strict rules for pension funds. I don't know how they get around it. Well, the people obviously seem to know how somewhere yes. along the way. And I don't know if they just sit there and wait. Maybe the people don't come ask for their money and then they can just keep it. I don't know. I don't know. But that so I just thought there's so many people having problems. We're going to talk pensions next week. So no, if you idea. have any problems, call us next week on the show. <laughs> right. If you have any questions now for Arinda, the number 0892 10 20 10. Peter, good evening. You're driving. Yes. Um, I, I'm actually packing uh, Oh, good. Of I'm so pleased yes. you're not driving. Okay. How can we help you, Peter? Yeah. I'm got a few uh, concerns regarding some sections which my company have uh, just uh, recently embarked on. The first one was uh, section 197, the major of uh, my division to the main company. Well, uh, when they explained it to us, they said nothing should change to individual employees for the next 12 months. But 
this was done on the 1st of April. To date, they have again embarked on Section 189, uh, retrenchment and, um, and, and uh, restructuring. So the thing is, they are actually uh, giving alternative uh, positions or, or, or duties to some uh, individuals whereby they are now asked to, 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 to be earning less than what they were earning with the, the previous division as it was before uh, all this. Is, is that acceptable? Is that allowed? So they've actually told you one thing in this document that they said nothing would change in the next 12 months and they've no sooner given you that when they've changed everything. Yes, yes. That's what. That's the, exactly the situation now. Yes, that does not sound right. That's definitely... They can't say one thing and then do something, do else. something completely else. Um, I know retrenchments, there's a lot of rules and regulations regarding how you can do it and how you affect it. Um, I Obviously, I don't specialize in labor law, but I would assume if you approach a labor law specialist that they would be able to assist you in telling you if the process has been handled correctly or if all the rules and regulations has been complied with. Peter, if you if you like, I can keep your number. So next time Michael Bagram is on, he's our labor law expert. Mm -hmm. We can call you if you like, and then you can actually um, chat with him because he'll be able to tell you exactly what's going on. Yes, he would be. No, I'll, I'll, I'll be very happy to chat with him because this thing is an ongoing and I don't see it uh, giving joy to our members. Okay, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Peter, I'm I'm going to put you back to my producer now. If you can just give him an email address for yourself, so I can just email you and tell you what when this will all be happening. Okay, fine. All right, so okay. just hold the line. Okay. I'm going to put you back to my producer now. Okay. I'll, I'll Thank, thanks, Peter. Right, okay, now Michael comes on the first Monday of every month and sometimes in between the months in, because we get so many questions about mm -hmm. labor law and no, it just, it, it's the most, I'm listening to what Peter had to say now, it just, I can't quite figure out, we have all these labor laws, the mm -hmm. word law in there somewhere, but people just seem not to bother. They mm -hmm. just do whatever they feel like doing. Whatever it's just so like. weird. I don't <laughs> no, understand no, how no. they get away with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, this sounds bizarre. Okay, here's the thing, we're not going to do anything for 12 months. And, and then, then like the tomorrow, oh, sorry, we're retrenching all of you. Exactly. And what happened about the it thing you just gave me? No, it shouldn't be able doesn't to make like that no. at all. So we'll deal with that when Michael Bagram mm -hmm. comes back on again, because he would love to chat about that. <laughs> if you have any questions, 0892 10 20 10. We have about 20 minutes left, so if you want to get through, 0892 10 20 10. Joel in the Eastern Cape, good evening. Hi, Karen, good evening. Hello, how can we help you, Joel? Yes, Karen, uh, I belong to a, a, a company wherein I've got the shares uh, shareholding over thirty per over thirty percent. Now the the the, um, the 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 directors of the company do not. Uh, they, there's a lot of corruption that is going on in the company, and they do not want to uh, uh, issue out financial for part for two financial years. That is now 2014 and 2015. And uh, uh, I, and uh, the thing is, I, I haven't got the money now to to approach a private attorney with uh, with regards to getting the, the getting information from the company or using the the promotion of access to information uh, through courts. Now, how does one go about to stop the corruption that is going on in in, in company in the company? Arunda, big question. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I, I assume you are a minority shareholder, if I listen correctly. 30%, 30 he said. Is there sure. anyone with a bigger sh percentage than you? Come again? Is anybody got a bigger whole shareholding than you? Yeah, well, the, the, the bigger shareholding is held by a trust and an estate. Okay, okay. so you are, you are a minority shareholder and the, the Companies Act actually protects minority shareholders and their rights. So yes. you would have the right in your own person to go to the company, to go to the secretary, to go to the office and obtain any records that you might need or want to see or have. Um, just go and ask for it. You have the right to do that. I've, Re I've been trying that for the past uh, for the past year or so to 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 get information. Yes. I've I've written letters. I've approached uh, I've approached some certain attorneys, and then I ran short of money. Mm -hmm. They have uh, uh, the attorneys have written to them. They do not want to 
they do not want to give the information. And the, another thing is that the, the financials, they, they haven't prepared financials for the, for the past two financial periods. Yeah, that's definitely not in line with the Companies Act because you, yes. you definitely have a right to obtain all the information that you might need as a shareholder. Um, Where does it go from here now? Is there an organization or a body that he can approach? Unfortunately, I would I would say my advice would be to appoint a lawyer, even if well, it he can't is, afford it now. He says that he's even really if he goes to legal aid, you need a lawyer to help you with this because this is a very specialized field in company law, and to yeah. remove directors is very hard. Um, obviously, the shareholders can remove a director, but it is it's a double barrel because you're removed as a director but it's also your employment so you need to basically fire the director and go through the whole ccma process so it's it's quite hard if you wanted to remove any of the directors but for you to get access to the information it shouldn't it really shouldn't be this hard could possibly every, everybody says it shouldn't it shouldn't yes. be hard to get information yes. but why i i am not uh, i am not getting information joel i'm just i'm just going to ask around joel's in the eastern cape would he fall under the cape law society yes he would joel well i'm going to put you back to my producer can you give well he's actually on the phone right now um but basically i'm going to put you back to him if you can give him an email address mm -hmm. and i will send you the contact details of the cape law society under which eastern cape falls yes contact yes. them and they can possibly they do have lawyers that do take the occasional cases pro bono yes they should um, be i'm not saying they would do that but i'm just mm -hmm. saying there is that possibility mm -hmm. and if yeah. not they can possibly put you in touch with somebody that could help you in the field of company law because they have obviously lawyers in every sort of field that there is a possible and they would be able to put you in touch with the right people so i'm going to give you i'm going to email you that information um yes. so that you can get in touch with the cape law society oh okay but but isn't there isn't there a clause in the in the new company law that protects uh, that that one can run because i've also been to the the, the department of trade and industry Mm -hmm. And I did. I didn't get help from there. Yeah, I don't think it falls. It really falls under the Department of Trade and Industry. There is a specific clause in the Companies Act that protects your rights as a minority shareholder. That's why I yes. say it shouldn't be hard to get this information because you are protected in terms of the Act, and they yes. should give it to you, even if you then have to use your legal aid attorney to apply to court to force them to give you the I've, information. I've been, uh, I'm sorry, I've been to legal aid. Legal mm -hmm. aid says uh, it, uh, they do not uh, get involved in company, in company, yeah, in business. That's why they've yeah. been you the information for the Law Society or they were able to point you in the right direction, Joel. Yes. Oh, oh, all right. Uh, Ema, I'm, I'm going to put you back to my. Oh, he's back on the phone again. Um, <laughs> he's, he's on and off the phone. I'm going to put you back. I'll put you on hold now, and then he'll, right. he'll ask you get your email address from you, and I'll email you that information. All right. Okay. Well, Thanks, Joel. I'll stay on the line. Yeah, stay on the line. Don't hang up. Good luck. Thank Thanks, you. Joel. Good luck with that. Thank right. Uh, bye bye now. Off to Hammond's Kral now. Good evening, William. My name, my name is Jack. Hello, William. Good evening. Good evening. Can we help you, William? Hi. Yes, uh, I applied my pension on January this year, but I'm still waiting for it. You applied for your pension? <laughs> Again. Yeah. Pension. William, next week, we're doing pensions the whole of next week. We've got your okay, number. Then. What we're going to do, William, I'm going to actually call you next week. Well, we are not me, but my producer will call you next week on the show. And we will actually talk to a pension lawyer. So he'll be able okay. to possibly give you some advice. Because, Arunda, unless you want to deal with this. No, once yes, again, then. it shouldn't take that long. It shouldn't take that to long. To pay out your pension. It okay. really shouldn't. <laughs> All right. So we will call you during the show next week. And then you can talk to the attorney then. Thanks, man. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks, William. Good night to you. Bye. Right, you tuned to SAFM, South Africa's news and information leader. I'm Karen Key, and this is The Law Report. My guest tonight is attorney Arinda Tritter. She's a junior associate at Schoolman Law, Inc., attorneys, conveyances, and notaries public, practicing here in Cape Town. And we've got about 10 minutes left, so we've got a few calls standing by, but there's still time, I'm sure, for more. If you'd like to call now, 0892 
10 2010. Before we take our next call, I just want to tell you all again, it's Wills Week this week. Why should people be having their wills done, Arinda? It's very important. Yes, wills are very important and not only for distributing your property. I know people like to say, yeah, but I don't have a lot. Why should I have a will? It's not just about that. It's to provide security for the people you leave behind, your loved ones. It's appointing an executor to go about your wishes as you would like them to happen. It's about appointing someone to look after your children, even someone to look after your pets, because we know pets are four-legged children. And so it's not only your property, it's, it's much more than that. A will is really important. You need to have a will. And also stops all that possible squabbling at the end. Always. You know, there's always squabbling. It, everyone says, no, my family won't argue. My family won't. As soon as it happens, then your family turns into that family. <laughs> so you need to have a will to get all of that out of the way. Have it drafted by someone that knows how it needs to be drafted in terms of the act so that it doesn't get to the master and gets thrown out and is invalid. And also you need to remember you can't decide to leave your money to your friend down the road if you have a wife and children because they automatically the courts will place them as first beneficiaries. Yes, especially if you're married in community of property, then obviously your wife is entitled to 50% of the joint estate. Um, but if you don't have a will, you will, um, your spouse and your children will inherit interstate. And obviously with that, there's rules regarding that and you can't then leave a certain amount to someone or a legacy to the Children's Hospital Trust. You need to have that in a will, otherwise it won't happen. Okay, so rather do it. And it's free this week exactly. until Friday. And I've been harping on it. I'm sure people are getting sick and tired of me going on and on and on about this. It's really, been, I've been doing it all the last month or so. But it's it's so important. And un unfortunately, you're going to have to listen to me doing it again next year. So you've got one. This is your last week. And I'm sure there might be one or two spots available hmm. in places. So please do you drop me a mail, law at safm.co.za. I'll send you the list of the province you're in. So don't forget to tell me where you are in the country. Right, we've got a few more calls to take. We haven't quite got them on the line yet. We were so busy taking down email addresses and phone numbers and things for all our other people that uh, we had on the phone that uh, we haven't quite got around to getting our next caller up on the line. Um, but we'll be able to get him up soon. Right, so you're not involved in Wills Week this week. You no, normally are, but Nicolene's been away on maternity yes, leave. So, so but, mm. a bit rough there at the office because we won attorney down, so we're not participating this year. So she will be back. She will be back, definitely. Yes, we're and then excited mm. to have her back I'm as sure. well <laughs> i'm sure and next year's wills week i'm sure she'll be yes, involved in that she's very again. passionate about wills it's one of her big passions in life she loves it <laughs> right our next call is up jeff in durban good evening good evening ladies too um just a quick query please i was in hospital in december last year for medical tests and things mm -hmm. um advised by the doctor and i had obviously a lot of shortfalls and things Medical aid covered a portion of it, but there's a lot of co-payments, particularly when it comes to things like MRIs and all these sort of things. So I do have the gap cover through a, a company. Um, I submitted full claims. I gave them the whole history, all the medical bills, everything, even what the medical aid had paid. Nothing happened for months and months and months. Um, allegedly, the, the company was very busy. And then they've come back to me and they basically said that they owe me 8 Rand 92. And I said, nonsense, because I've got two co-payments on MRIs alone at about 1,800 Rand or 2,000 Rand at a time. There was a, um, also a claim I put in for my daughter who had to have um, emergency casualty treatments and things. And, you know, we're now September and I'm still getting nowhere with this company. I'm talking with a broker. I get no correspondence. There's no, nothing at all just verbal. How would I approach it from here? Do I go to an ombudsman or? Yes, because obviously I don't have your, your gap cover documentation in front of me that you signed with them so i don't know what mm -hmm. the terms and conditions of that is but i can't imagine that they only owe you eight rand that does <laughs> not seem correct um so i would say if you don't get right with them um maybe approach the department of health no but that wouldn't really complain, fall the gap cover no that's insurance gonna, short-term insurance it's, really yes because yeah. that's gonna fall wouldn't it fall under the short-term insurance ombud Maybe. Wouldn't a short-term insurance ombudsman? Or, yes, you know, that's what I'm saying. No, I think short. I think. I think you start. Well, first of all, I think my first my first thing would be to look at the document yes. to see exactly what it is because I, I know I I've got gap cover two different types of the thing. Well, two mm. one is the one thing, one is something else. 
they don't cover the same things no, and they're yeah. very, these are very Terms specific about yeah. what they cover and so I, if, I, if I was you first of all check your documentation mm. that they've yeah. given you and secondly I would go to the short-term insurance ombud mm. well as I say the, you know when I, uh, it's the top of the range gap cover um, and according to the broker yes it is all covered because I was in hospital at the time they cover shortfalls anything that's not paid type of thing mm. but I say you know when when are nine months ten months down the line yeah, and they only came back they only came back to me about um, six weeks ago, and then I've, I've called him in. We've had another thing. I've complained. He said they're going to do a review, but it's just like you know, that was six, eight weeks ago again. Mm. Mm. I, I would start the, getting. I would. I would start very, very slowly. I would start getting slightly loud, Jeff. <laughs> you know. You don't um, want to hear loud. Oh, oh, you, do, oh loud. you also do loud. Okay, no, because I, I, I do loud. Um, <laughs> but no, you, I mean, that's why you've got a broker. I'm sure you're paying him fees and that to be your broker. He should be dealing with us, surely. Well, he says he's submitting it all to the company, but as I say, there's no correspondence, there's nothing. Well, I'm getting this communi in a verbal communication from this guy. Well, I would demand that you get something in writing from mm -hmm. him personally. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I would just relook at your broker then. I mean, he's obviously not doing his job properly, surely. Yes. Well, as I say, the company, even the company, I've tried to approach them and I can't get any sense or anything out of them. So I thought, well, rather let's just deal through the broker. Well, if I was you, I would just bypass everybody. Marinda, what would you think? Go straight yes. to the short term no, insurance ombud. I would also do that, rather. Okay. And if that, uh, apart from them, anything else? No, I think that I think that should cover it. Yeah, there's no one really else that you no, could because it falls under no, short term insurance. No, about the Department of Health, but obviously not it's a really. private it's company, a company, so yeah. it's yeah. not going to fall yeah. under that. Okay, super. Thank you so much for helping. Try the short term insurance on with Jeff. Hopefully, they'll be able to help you. Thank you, ladies. Have right, a good evening. You too. Bye bye now. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night. Right, Lydia in the Free State, if we can be quite quick, I'd be grateful. We've got literally two and a half minutes. Good evening. How can we help you? Yeah, ma'am, I, I was. Uh, I resigned in 1999. I was a teacher with the service for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And I was. I was. I was it's, it's with regard to my pension. I got only fifty one thousand, and nobody. It was paid into my bank account, and no, no, uh, it was not no breakdown or nothing. And then I, ju I, I just received it fifty one thousand by that without anybody saying anything to me. And then it was like just like that until today. Somebody told me that no, I think you've got to take it up with the GEPF. It cannot be like that. Fifteen years service, and then you get fifty one thousand. Lydia, I want we next week we're going to be talking pensions. The whole show is just going to be on pensions. Yes, I've got your phone number. What we will do is we will call you during the show yes, and we will actually put you on with the pension lawyer because that's all he does. He deals with pension problems. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank we you, will we will call you during the show next week, okay? And then you can okay. talk to him. Okay, ma'am. Thanks, Lydia. Thank Have a you, good evening. Bye bye now. But I don't envy the lawyer next week. I think he's going no, to be he's really busy. A lot of questions because yeah. <laughs> this this is just an ongoing issue. It's just yes. like, oh my goodness, I'm starting to think when I retire one day, am I going to have this drama? No, actually, I don't actually have a pension fund, so that yeah, <laughs> I'm fine. I have my own private stuff that I have to do because I don't have a pension fund. So I think I'll probably be okay because yes. I won't have a pension fund because it sounds like a nightmare. No, it does. It really does. Gosh, okay. Right, uh, we've had a call here on the, regarding Second World War payouts from Trevor. Trevor, if you can be, is he on the line? No, okay. Trevor, I'm not quite sure what your query is regarding Second World War payouts. Um, don't know, there was, I think some people did get a pension. I know my dad did, he got a pension after he came back from the war. So, I mean, there is that. Um, and I'm not quite sure if that's something we deal with. It, that would fall under pensions, probably. Yes. So maybe next week, we'll, we've got your number, Trevor. We'll call you. Maybe the, our lawyer can help you next week. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, my thanks once again this evening to uh, Attorney Arinda Tritter. And she's a junior associate at Schoolman Law Inc. Attorneys, Conveyances and Notaries Public and their practice here in Cape Town. She's been my guest on tonight's edition of the Law Report program. Arinda, thank you very much indeed for joining us. And thank you for stepping into Nicolene's shoes for the last few months. Big shoes to fill. Yeah, big shoes. But it was really fun and I really enjoyed it. Well, I do it. hope to see you, you back with her me. again. I'm sure she'll need some moral support. I mean, <laughs> new baby. You know, it, it makes you a little tired. Yes, right. no, I can imagine. Okay. Well, <laughs> Nicolene is due to be back with us again for the next edition of the Law Clinic, and that's Monday the 10th of October. The Law Report is on the air on SAFM every Monday evening between 9 and 10. And in next week's program, as I've been mentioning all the way through the show, I'll be joined in studio by attorney Jonathan Moot, and we'll be talking about pension funds. And as you might have noticed, even from tonight's show, we've had so many questions regarding pension funds that I thought it deserved its own show. So that'll happen next Monday, the 19th of September.